Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome back to Lost in Adaptation, the YouTube show dedicated to comparing film adaptations of books to said books to see how loyally the plot and themes were held to. So Forrest Gump, cultural juggernaut, winner of six Academy Awards and based on a book. Even if you haven't seen it, you probably have some idea of the plot from Cultural Osmosis, the story of a young man from Alabama with an unspecified but severe intellectual disability who manages to good-naturedly bumble his way through decades of adventures gaining fame and fortune. It's something of a polarizing film these days and I promise I will tear off the nostalgia goggles in a moment to discuss the parts that age phenomenally poorly, but love it or hate it, none can deny the film's impact. If you're a millennial, you have quoted this film at some point. That is just a fact of life. This film was a meme before memes were a thing. It was a childhood favourite for both myself and my big sister and due to fortuitous timing, I happened to be visiting her when this episode came up, so we got to watch it together again, which is really nice. In fact, I would just like to address her directly for a moment if you would be kind enough to bear with me. Hi Jesse, I know you're watching this. Stop. Please don't watch the rest of this episode. Trust me, you don't want to know and you don't have to follow me down this path. Is she gone? Okay good, I cannot be the one to taint this particular childhood memory. So, Book Forest is kind of racist and ableist and cynical and the whole book is just kind of bad. I figured that I was going to have to adjust my expectations from the literal first sentence. Instead of life is like a box of chocolates, you never know what you're going to get, Forrest instead starts his story with, let me tell you, being an idiot is no box of chocolates. <sighs> Well, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. Forrest Gump was published in 1986 and is the work of a Mr. Winston Groom, born in Washington DC but raised in Fairhope, Alabama. He served in the US Army as a second lieutenant and did a rather unpleasant tour in the Vietnam War. After his discharge, he started working as a journalist and non-fiction writer and was awarded a Pulitzer Prize for Conversations with the Enemy, the real life story of a prisoner of war. Forrest Gump was his first attempt at a fiction novel and he claims it was written over the span of just six weeks. According to Groom, the titular Forrest was inspired by an offhand story his father recounted to him about a child that he used to know who had several developmental issues but was very good at playing the piano, although he worded it slightly differently. He began to recollect when he was a young boy in his neighborhood there was another young boy who was with and the kids used to chase him and tease him and you know do what kids will do. Yeah. At some point this young man's mother taught him how to play the piano and the other kids decided that um, they would quit this teasing and stuff and took him under their wings. So I thought, well, um, maybe I can use this as a scene somewhere in a book later on. And I went home that evening, sat down to take some notes, and by midnight I had written the first chapter of Forrest Gump. He also mentioned watching a segment on 60 Minutes about Savant Syndrome, though back then it had a different official name that I would rather not say out loud. I have found no evidence whatsoever that he did any more research on the subject before writing the book and good lord in heaven it shows. Forrest is also partly based on Groom himself as they share many characteristics and life events, namely being exceptionally tall and fighting in Vietnam. It's written in the first person and appears to be some sort of memoir an elderly Forrest is writing, though there isn't an establishing I am writing this account because moment you sometimes get in other books using this format. I suppose to add to the immersion, many words are misspelled or transcribed phonetically in a Southern American accent. I can't say that my dyslexic ass loved this, but it's a choice I guess. As I said, I don't think this book is very good, but it was reasonably well received at the time, selling about 30,000 copies, getting some good reviews, and successfully selling the film rights before publication. The success of the film shot book sales up to over 1 million copies and a spot on the bestsellers list, something that bemused the author somewhat. Said film, a Paramount Picture production, was released on the 6th of July, 1994. It was directed by Robert Zemeckis, who it turns out wasn't the first or even second choice for the role, landing the gig after Terry Gilliam turned it down and Barry Sunnerfield decided to leave the project to direct The Addams Family instead. The screenplay was written by Eric Roth, whose filmography is a surprising range between the bad, the good and the Fingers crossed it doesn't suck. It starred Tom Hanks, Robin Wright, Gary Sinness, McKelty Williamson, Sally Field, and a very young Haley Joel Osment who snuck in right at the end for his first feature film appearance. Amongst other things, it's known for its at the time very, very impressive special effects that were orchestrated by Ken Ralston, inserting Tom Hanks into archive footage of historical events and meticulously removing Gary Sinness's legs when his character loses them in the Vietnam War. It won Best Picture, Director, Actor, Screenplay, Film Editing, and Visual Effects 
Oscarics at the Oscars and Best Actor, Director and Motion Picture at the Golden Globes. The film's popularity inspired a ton of merchandise and even the founding of a seafood restaurant chain which I've eaten at a few times. It's okay. The crabs are a bit overpriced. It's often regarded as an emotional, slightly tragic but still feel-good flick and, as I mentioned, I have a personal fondness for it as a childhood favourite. To this day, I am never not going to cry at at least half a dozen scenes. I think it deserved every award it received. That said, I am a firm believer that we must be willing to acknowledge the problematic elements of a piece of work no matter the nostalgic connection and this film has more than its fair share of things that aged either pretty badly or were always kind of shit, including but not not limited to infantilizing people with intellectual disabilities, using the condition for laughs, and further popularizing the already prevalent savant syndrome trope. Appearing to take an apolitical stance on the Vietnam War, presenting the deaths there as a personal tragedy as opposed to a senseless waste brought on by corruption and incompetence at the highest level. Depicting all participants in the anti-war movement as, at best, eccentric, hypermanic, ineffective social justice warriors and, at worst, abusive monsters looking to blame others for their toxic behavior. Portraying the Black Panther Party, the black power political movement created for the self-defense of victims of systemic racism and police brutality as aggressive, violent thugs willing to immediately pull firearms on anyone who crosses them. Implying that God himself wrecked an entire state's worth of predominantly black-owned businesses so a pair of white men could gain a monopoly. And let us not forget pushing the age-old lie that pulling oneself up by one's bootstraps and going from rags to riches is equally possible for people from all stations in life if they are only willing to work hard enough. It's no wonder this film is a favourite amongst conservatives, it ticks off a lot of their boxes. I know I'm stepping out of my lane here slightly as I'm not part of any of the groups being problematically portrayed in this film, but I've always had the impression that these things came off more like a lack of awareness than an active mean-spiritedness on the part of the filmmakers. In fact, now that I've had a chance to compare it to its origin, I'm actually kind of impressed they managed to make it as comparatively inoffensive as it is. Let's talk adaptation. I came within the distance of a bee's kneecap to deeming this film an adaptation in name only, but it just scraped over the admittedly arbitrary line I set for these things. However, to help keep things straight, I'm going to subdivide this comparison into stuff they stuck to, things that were just in the film and not in the book, things that were in both but handled differently, and things that were just in the book and not in the film. Now that I say that out loud, I am not entirely convinced that this is going to make it less complicated instead of more, but time will tell I suppose. <laughs> If one chooses one's words very carefully, while describing the most basic overview of the plots, you can draw some parallels between Groom's book and the film. The story being a chronicle of the exceptionally eventful and exciting life of the neurodivergent and very talented Mr. Forrest Gump that begins with his childhood in the 1950s and progresses through the next several decades. The rather disturbing fact that he was named after his ancestor, a Civil War general who went on to found the Ku Klux Klan. Being raised by his single mother who runs a boarding house in Alabama, USA, and forming a friendship and later intense romantic fixation on his school friend Jenny, who comes in and out of his life several times throughout the plot. In pressing a high school football coach with his speed while attempting to escape from some bullies, earning him a place on the team, which eventually leads to a college scholarship so he can play for the All-Americans, not entirely sure what that is, and meet President John F. Kennedy, who, due to the unfortunately timed consumption of multiple sodas, he informs that he has to pee. Beating the piss out of Jenny's boyfriend, having mistaken them getting busy in a car for an assault. Forrest ending up in the army and deployed to the Vietnam War, in which he is wounded, saving the lives of multiple squad mates, but alas, not his best friend Bubba, who dies in his arms, ending his dreams of starting a shrimping company when he got home. Forrest keeping the dream alive because Bubba had offered to make him a partner in this new business, and it never occurs to him that Bubba's death might nullify the plan. Another army buddy, Lieutenant Dan, being badly wounded and losing both his legs in a double amputation. Forrest discovering that he has an affinity for the game of table tennis and being selected to represent the US Army in a tournament hosted by Communist China, getting awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor by President Lyndon B. Johnson, whom he shows his butt after taking a passing comment about wishing he could have seen his injury, literally. Crossing paths with Lieutenant Dan again, who has fallen on rather hard times since getting sent home from the war. Being surprisingly successful in the shrimping industry and becoming a millionaire. Reuniting with Jenny, who bears his child and names him after him, though alas, they don't end up being together for long. So yeah, as you can see, for better or worse, the book and the film share the core concept of the ultimate passive protagonist and derive their humour from his atypical reactions to situations due to his intellectual disorder. It's my boat. 
Right then, the following are unique to the film. Everything that happens in the waiting for a bus framing device, Forrest's childhood leg braces, his mother sleeping with the school principal to secure her son a place there, Jenny's traumatic sexual abuse at the hands of her alcoholic father, Forrest's lonely island moment with Jenny at her college, inspiring Elvis Presley's dance moves, John Lennon's imagined lyrics, and other famous pop culture icons like the Shit Happens bumper sticker and the Smiley Face logo, the drill sergeant who constantly bellows positive affirmations, inadvertently sparking off the Watergate scandal, his impromptu unheard speech in Washington that resulted in a happy reunification with Jenny, sitting in on a meeting of the Black Panthers and wailing on another of Jenny's lovers, this time more justifiably, Lieutenant Dan's entire arc, including his resentment at Forrest and God for saving his life and robbing him of the glorious death in battle he believed to be his destiny, his eventual reconciliation with both, his wife and his titanium legs, Forrest becoming a gardener despite being immensely rich, buying stock in Apple computers, presumably launching him into to filthy levels of rich. Well, shit, Forrest is the 1% now. We have to eat him. Going on a three year run across the entirety of America and inadvertently starting some sort of cult. Jenny and Forrest getting married and Forrest being a father to his son. I'll explain shortly. In addition to the chocolate line, other highly quoted gumpisms such as Run Forest Run, Stupid Is As Stupid Does, Lieutenant Dan, Ice Cream, My Name Is Forrest Gump, People Call Me Forrest Gump, That's About It, That's All I Have To Say About That, and I Guess Sometimes There Just Aren't Enough Rocks were also original creations. If any of these things were your favourite part of the film, then you have Eric Roth, not Winston Groom, to thank for them. That's all I have to say about that. I would have to say that the most significant shift the film made away from the book was their decision to make Forrest Gump not a massive asshole. The first thing that comes to mind when I think of Tom Hanks as Forrest Gump is what an optimistic, kind, caring, trusting dude he is. He spends the better part of two decades casually enriching the lives of everyone he crosses paths with, even if they don't realise it at first. Book Forrest, well... <sighs> Let me just describe him and you'll see what I'm talking about. Written for Mr. Gump is six foot six inches tall and naturally built like Lou Ferrigno. He was originally recruited into the football team based purely on his exceptional size and the later discovery of his exceptional speed was just a bonus. At the start of the book, Forrest claims that he's a lot smarter than he appears to be and simply has a lot of trouble interacting with things and people in the heat of the moment and I have to say I believe him. He's often very aware of how foolish looking his actions are and constantly constantly chastises himself for not being able to handle situations better. Groom also wasn't subtle in the way he went about establishing this hidden intelligence. One of the first things that Forrest does in his introduction is list all the classic literature he's read like he's an insecure hipster at a college party. He has severe issues with social skills, deductive reasoning, writing and memorization, but damn amazing at pretty much everything else. He's able to effortlessly master every musical instrument, advance mathematics, sports and chess playing, and even for his size he's exceptionally strong. Now, unfortunately, Unfortunately, the recountings of his life to date are peppered with constant complaints, cynicism, mean-spirited comments, racism, and believe it or not, quite a bit of ableism. I don't know how else to say this, but Forrest Gump calls people the N-word a lot. He claims he has no issue with people of colour, but then spends the rest of the book referring to them exclusively with hate speech. He also refers to every Asian person that he meets, with the slur used to describe the North Vietnamese in that period. Now I know what you might be thinking, Dom, how could Forrest be racist when his best friend was Bubba? Well, it's quite simple, Bubba was a white man in the book. Forrest is involuntarily committed to a specialist school and an inpatient psychiatric ward during the story, and wow does he consider himself above the other students and patients. He absolutely absolutely hates having to spend time with anyone with neural diversity or any mental health issues. So yes, that was unpleasant to read. Book Forrest tends to ruin more lives than he improves throughout. Every time someone puts their faith in him, be they attempting to use him for their selfish gain or trying to form a genuine mutually beneficial partnership with him, he inevitably does or says something that results in it all going horribly wrong and occasionally culminating in them losing everything. It's a bit of a bummer, to be frank. Unlike in the film where all of the worst things to happen to Forrest are either due to someone else's poor life choices or acts of God, Book Forrest is directly responsible for a lot of his personal tragedies due to his serious inflated hubris and ignorant stubbornness. I'll explain more about it in a bit, but the reason that he and Jenny don't stay together originally was due to his colossal vanity ruining their relationship. Speaking of Jenny, you can forget everything you know about the tragic figure of the film. For starters, she doesn't 
die at the end, which was a bit of a shock for me. The romance between her and Forrest becomes mutual much quicker. About halfway through the story, they start having nasty sex. Book Gump is quite naturally gifted in this skill set as well, apparently. They were still pretty on again, off again, but not because she was perpetually running away from him to seek worse and worse situations, because Forrest kept ruining things and then crawling back to her to beg for forgiveness. Lieutenant Dan, the ice cream hater, is another character who turned out to be utterly unrecognizable from his book original. He and Forrest didn't meet until after Gump is shot in the butt and ends up in the army hospital. He was a tank officer who was unfortunately inside his vehicle when it was blown up by the enemy. In addition to eventually losing his legs, he's also pretty severely scarred all over his body and face. Despite this, he starts his part of the story fairly optimistic, waxing philosophical about the nature of destiny and fate and getting along with Forrest quite well. His optimism doesn't fade until he gets home and his life utterly falls apart due to his disability. His wife leaves him, he loses his job and his home, and the poor fuck doesn't even get a sodding wheelchair. He's left to drag himself around on a wheeled pallet and a stick. There was no fateful storm involved in the success of Gump's Shrimping Company, which incidentally wasn't named in the book. Forrest didn't even use a boat. He learned how to breed shrimp in ponds from a farm in Vietnam, and the technique worked crazy well in America. The I got to pee line comes back again and again and again in the book. It's essentially Gump's catchphrase whenever he's the center of attention. I'm struggling to imagine how Groom could have thought that that joke had that level of repeat value. Here's an interesting one. Forrest's dad was not on vacation and never coming back in the book. He worked a job at the docks unloading fruit and was crushed to death by several tons of bananas when Forrest was just an infant. The poor lad was, understandably, not very keen on getting his five a day after that. Is there a Mr. Gump? Mrs. Gump? He's on vacation. Like with most film adaptations, there's a ton of small things in almost every scene that had to be cut to allow the story to cohesively fit into the new medium, so I'm not going to go into those, but instead concentrate on the two major sections of the book that were omitted entirely. The shorter of the two takes place right after Forrest graduates high school. The poor bugger is immediately conscripted into the army, but deserts within the first hour when he panics and runs away during a prostate exam. His mother goes to bat for him with the military police, and he's given an exemption due to his condition. His mama then wingwomans him, and arranges a movie date with Jenny, during which he laughs at the death scene in Body and Clyde, then accidentally rips all of her clothes off while trying to help her from tripping not surprisingly leading to his arrest. He's given leniency by the judge because of his football scholarship and goes to the University of Alabama, where his new teammates continue the theme of sports stars getting away with literally any crime, up to and including discharging firearms in a crowded public place and assaulting police officers. Surprisingly, he reconnects with Jenny, who was apparently over the whole public indecency incident, and they form a folk music band together. It goes quite well for a little while until Forrest beats up another member of the band due to a misunderstanding involving Jenny and the backseat of a car. Then Forrest fails enough classes to flunk out and finds out that the army has changed its mind and ships him off to boot camp. The far larger missing segment starts during the ping pong tournament in China and then basically continues until the end of the story. It's funny that the film goes right into Forrest seeing his mother and starting his shrimp company as, in the book, these events become one of those simple goals that keep getting pushed back and pushed back beyond all reason as other stuff keeps getting in the way. It's kind of like a slapstick retelling of the Odyssey. After the tournament, Chairman Mao of the Chinese government attempted a PR stunt by swimming across a river in front of his American guests, but fails and starts to drown halfway. Local officials are panicked into uselessness, so Forrest has to be the one to dive in and save him. The chairman was so grateful, he throws a parade in his honor. His actions were initially frowned upon by his superiors, but apparently eventually helped with Chinese-American relations in the long run. After that, an army colonel gets the bright idea to use Gump as a Captain Deep South America and drags him around a rather hostile country on a recruitment drive. This proved disastrous as Forrest wasn't able to learn his script and, when asked his opinion about the war, would respond honestly and describe it as a piece of shit. The colonel's career was ruined and Gunt was given the job of shoveling coal for the remainder of his service. When he gets out of the army, he's faced with the choice of going to find his mother, who is apparently living in a Catholic poorhouse due to his family home burning down, or going to find Jenny. He chooses the latter. It turns out she's in a moderately successful rock band now and is delighted to see Forrest, inviting him to join her musical endeavors once again. A college professor tricks him into becoming the subject in his class about, uh, 
and drags him into acting in a performance of King Lear, which he instantly regrets when Forrest accidentally burns down his classroom with a flaming torch. The band then gets signed by a major record label and go on tour. After Jenny gets cheated on by like five lovers in a row, she comes to Forrest for comfort and, seeing him in a different light for the first time, she initiates freaky sex with him. They start dating and once again things go well for a while, until another band member talks Forrest into trying marijuana for the first time and he becomes psychologically addicted to its relaxing effects. His changed behavior eventually starts to put a serious strain on their relationship, but he refuses to cut down. Forrest is then sexually assaulted by two groupies and lacks the ability to explain himself when Jenny walks in on them. To blow off some steam, Jenny goes to Washington to take part in the anti-war protests, gets arrested, and the police forcefully shave her head, supposedly due to lice. An event is organized in which veterans are supposed to throw away their medals onto the steps of the Capitol building, and Jenny talks Forrest into taking part, as lobbing his Congressional Medal of Honor would make a big statement. Unfortunately, Forrest throws it way too hard and knocks out the clerk of the US Senate with it. He's arrested and committed to an institution where he's sexually harassed by one of the female doctors. Okay, this is where things get crazy super weird. I, I, I don't usually have to say this, but I promise you I am not making any of this up, my beautiful watchers. When his sick math skills are discovered, he's conscripted into NASA to serve as a navigator on an experimental spaceship that's being test flown to see if it can be used to reach Mars. The other crew members are Major Janet Fritch, the first female astronaut, and and an orangutan named Sue. A big deal is made of Sue being female and therefore less aggressive, but no one really explains why they need an ape on the flight at all. Their launch is delayed and then suddenly restarted, and they're rushed back to the rocket so fast they don't realize they've grabbed the wrong orangutan until just before launch, and a huge angry male is strapped in behind them. Major Fritch attempts to cool things off, but NASA decides they don't give a fuck and blasts them off into space, then, not wanting to look stupid, orders them to pretend like the ape is Sue. This plays out about as well as you might expect, and New Sue smashes up the spaceship. Houston, we have a problem. They barely survive a crash landing back on Earth and end up off course in Papua New Guinea, and uh, prisoners of a tribe of cannibal natives. Now, this group is very loosely based on the real life cargo cult, but are described with every racist troop in the book, including the grass skirts and the bones through the septum. Their chief, Big Sam, is a one note joke in that he's very well spoken in English, despite being an enthusiastic cannibal, as he was educated at Yale before returning to his tribe. The major claims that NASA will be arriving soon to rescue them but they don't turn up for four years. And during this time, Big Sam decides to put his new friends to work cotton picking in his fields instead of eating them, and teaches Forrest how to play chess, which he of course becomes a master at immediately. Meanwhile, Forrest and a now calm as Sue become friends and figure out how to communicate with each other. Then the Major is, without warning, forcefully pulled in some bushes by a tribe member and enjoys what happens to her there so much she falls in love with him. After Forrest has a multi-year winning streak, Big Sam makes it clear that he plans to eat him if he ever manages to beat him again, and finally does so just as they're on the verge of getting a boat ride back to modern civilization. They're saved from the cooking pot by an attack from the native's arch enemy, the Pygmies, who kill, eat, and shrink the heads of Big Sam and everyone else except the Americans and the Major's boyfriend, who escape and are rescued by NASA, who finally show up, apparently having decided that they just had more important things to do until now. Major Fritch decides that she is just done with all this bullshit, and goes off with her lover to form their own tribe in the jungle, and Sue decides to stay behind as well on account of being an orangutan. Once again, deciding to go and find Jenny instead of seeing his mother, Forrest runs into a rather down-on-his-luck homeless Lieutenant Dan, who pledges to help him find his lost love. They eventually track her down working in a tire factory, and she's very pleased to see Forrest again. All three of them then team up to help with the master plan of becoming shrimping entrepreneurs. Forrest starts making money by doing competitive arm wrestling challenges in a dive bar, and gets talent scouted to be a wrestler by what appears to be the WWE. He's assigned an embarrassing persona, the dunce, and is given a diaper and a hat to wear, but despite this quite enjoys it because he likes being famous again. They quickly save up the money they would need to start the business, but Forrest refuses to quit. Jenny starts falling into a depression because she's reached the point in her life where she just wants to settle down and have a family and can't take living Forrest's crazy lifestyle anymore. The last straw is when Dan talks Forrest into a dishonest scheme to bet all of their money on him in a scripted match she's supposed to lose. Jenny feels she has no choice but to leave. On top of that, he ends up losing the match and all of his money anyway. Racked with guilt for leading him down a dark path, Dan feels he has to banish himself and go back to living on the streets. While waiting for a bus back to Alabama, Forrest gets into a chess match with a retired world champion and the old guy talks him into entering a competition for the 
the prize money. While training for this, Forrest is once again discovered, this time by a Hollywood film director who casts him to play the part of the monster in a remake of The Creature from the Black Lagoon. During filming, Gump accidentally tears all of the clothes off real-life actress Rachel Welch, who I guarantee had no idea she was going to be in this book and probably still doesn't know that she was. Sue, of all people, or apes I guess, turns up again, having been recaptured and forced into working in Hollywood in a Tarzan movie. While attempting to get her off the set without anyone seeing her naked, all three of them manage to fall over a fence, down the side of an embankment, and onto the edge of the freeway, forcing the poor humiliated woman to streak across half of Hollywood to a clothing store where they're all arrested for not having any money to pay for a new dress. Forrest is fired and goes back to the chess tournament where it is unclear if he wins or not because he was on the verge of getting disqualified for distracting his opponent by farting when Sue turned up and the whole thing dissolved into a mass panic. His chess teacher gives him the money anyway and sends him back home and Sue becomes Gump's permanent sidekick from here on. Finally back in Alabama, Forrest immediately accidentally gets his mother fired from her job at a laundry then, meets Bubba's father who gives him some tips on shrimping. Forrest then starts his company and is very successful, one of the only moments the film briefly realigned with the book in the second half. He hires basically everyone who he met in the entire book to come and work for him, except for Dan who he can't find and Jenny who he is heartbroken to be informed is happily married now. As his business grows his fame starts to rise again so a politician suggests that he capitalise on his adventures and glory and run for a position in the US Senate. Things go surprisingly well because the entire state absolutely loves that he accidentally made his slogan I got to pee because they somehow interpret it as an endorsement of whatever political opinion they hold. However, it all comes crashing down when his life's many great disasters are discovered as well, this being back in a time when a past record of multiple sex scandals was something that could kill a political career. His friends and family notice that Forrest is slipping into a depression as he gets older and isn't really enjoying being a millionaire CEO, so suggest that he go and take a long vacation. Sue comes with him to keep him company and they end up running into Dan again. On a whim, Forrest starts a one-man band and becomes a busker in New Orleans and one day Jenny and her son turn up in his audience. Jenny reveals the boy is called Forrest and that he is his biological father, which her husband is not aware of and that she's pretty happy living the quiet life with him, apologising for leaving but explaining that she wasn't able to bring up a child in the kind of environment he was creating with his wrestling career. Forrest gives instructions that almost all of his money is to go to Little Forrest and Jenny, then spends the next 20 years living as a street performer with Dan and Sue. The book ends with him age 60, musing that he has led an interesting life and is satisfied with his place in the world now. So that was a lot. An unpleasant recurring theme in the book that was thankfully passed over by the film is sexual assault and humiliation played for laughs. In addition to Forrest accidentally dragging Jenny and Rachel Welch into public nudity, he himself is forced to strip and be leered at by older women on multiple occasions. He lost his virginity as a teenager via being raped by a woman staying in his mother's boarding house because he was just too confused by what was happening and obedient to instructions to object to it. Again, all of these things were presented as humorous situations. And final thoughts. I'd say that a good 90% of the choices made in this adaptation were improvements to the story or at least resulted in a more pleasant experience which to be fair isn't what everyone wants from their stories but I definitely prefer it. I was surprised therefore to realise there were one or two things that might have actually been a downgrade in the film. Jenny for example, after seeing how much the original character had her shit together it kind of irks me that they decided to warp her into the ultimate damaged mess of a person, bouncing her from one tragically terrible situation to another for her entire short life then fridging her right at the end just to add emotion to Forrest Gump's journey. I do appreciate that they wrote it so she eventually manages to stabilise her life herself without Forrest magically fixing it for her, but they could at least have let her stay a rock and roll star. As unpleasant as the cynicism imbued into the novel was, combined with Groom's clear, hard stance that the Vietnam War was a piece of shit, it kept the book from coming off as a revisionist whitewashed version of American history like the film. Don't get me wrong though, I am most definitely not recommending it over the film or even in general. It's a depiction of neurodiversity based on a person the author never met and while I don't necessarily think that Groom is racist, he certainly thinks it's funny to write a character who is and the sexual assault played for laughs is just cringe inducing. Hard skip. So, did anything happen next? Why yes, thank you for asking. There seems to have been some drama between Groom and the studio after the film's release, though not because of creative differences. In addition to a $350,000 upfront payment, Groom was supposed to receive 3% shares of the film's net profits. However, despite its clear blockbuster success, Paramount evidently pulled some tricksy Hollywood accounting to posit that the film lost money. Groom didn't receive a penny more, while Hanks and Zemeckis, who were also contracted for a percentage, somehow 
took home 40 million each. And to add insult to injury, Groom was not mentioned once in any of the film's six Oscar winning speeches, which considering how little of his book was actually in the film is understandable, but still a rather undiplomatic move. Groom and Paramount evidently eventually buried the hatchet as Groom spoke relatively positively about the film in later years and denied bad blood. Though fun fact, apparently he thought it would have been better with John Goodman playing Forrest Gump. This calming of tensions was no doubt helped by the seven figure down payment that he was given for the rights to the film sequel. Oh yes, there was indeed a sequel book and a sequel film got a good ways into pre-production before it was dropped. Forrest Gump and Co, published in 1995, contains several meta references to the film, including opening with a complaint about inaccurate life stories, and Forrest meeting Tom Hanks, suggesting it was a biopic that real life Forrest Gump wasn't best pleased with. The plot is about the same combination of bizarre and depressing as the first book. Gump Shrimp goes under, Forrest is briefly recruited back into professional football until he's informed that Jenny and her husband have died, and he abandons his team to go and see his son. Forrest then bounces between a ton of weird jobs like pig farming and playing Goliath at a theme park run by famous televangelist fraudster Jim Backer. Despite Groom's payday, from what Eric Roth has revealed about the plot, it was going to have even less in common with its book than its predecessor. It also sounds like it would have been, uh, bad. Starting immediately after the conclusion of the last film, Forrest would soon have to deal with finding out that Jenny had passed on the AIDS virus to their son, end up directly involved in the O.J. Simpson murder case, and start a relationship with a Native American woman who would eventually die right before his eyes in a terrorist attack. I kid you not, Roth turned in this script on September 10th, 2001. A few days later, he, Hanks, and Zemeckis unanimously agreed that they should just not. I am going to level with you guys. All of this behind the scenes stuff and even the adaptation related review kind of faded away from me after a while because they were all overpowered by my burning need to know what the heck was Groom's beef with NASA. I mean, no one gets a good representation in this book, but this was straight up character assassination. What did NASA do to him? Did they reject an application at some point and crush his dreams of being an astronaut? Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. Please don't forget to do all those cool things that help power up a YouTube channel shield against the horrors of the malevolent algorithm, like commenting, sharing, and liking. Be sure to check out my Patreon page for rewards, requests, and exclusive content. Look me up on Twitter for updates about future episodes, and take care of yourselves out there because uh, I worry. See you next time. Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Holtz, Atel Spurdlov, and Kat Harker. Shout out to Ill Nedge for writing the end credits music. And an extra special thank you to this episode's co-producer, Kate Robinson. Be sure to check out her channel for more of that sweet, sweet YouTube content. He started working as a journalist and non-fiction writer, willing a... Willing? And non-fiction writer, willing... Willing... Winning... And non-fiction writer, willing... Winning a public pol... Okay, well, of course I get pulled so wrong after that. Non-fiction writer, willing a... I did it again. I'm gonna bloody destroy the word winning.